Happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. I'm blessed to be one myself. I've got three amazing kids. And recently, I wrapped up a 10-day stretch where I had them all to myself. Yay! Uh, my wife went away on business travel, so I got all three kids, just me and them. And it was fun, and there were lots of memories, but there was also some conflict. Uh, not a day went by where it was, you didn't cook it the way mom did, or you bought the wrong kind of orange juice, or combing my daughter's hair every morning, there were tears. Sometimes hers and sometimes mine. Uh, <laughs> but as kids, right, it's like conflict with our kids is not uncommon, right? And like when they're kids, we can handle it gently because they're kids. And it's like, so one of my uh, sweet little children growing up had this blanket that they never went anywhere without. And it was adorable, except every so often it would smell like a blanket they never went anywhere without. So we would have to wash it. We'd have to sneak it away from them and wash it. And what would happen is, as soon as they realized where is this blanket, and we had one of those front-loading washers so they could see it, like they could see it inches from their face, they would get so angry, and I could just say, relax, like it's okay, it'll, it'll be out in a little bit. But as they get older, the conflict becomes a little more challenging. And I think we can all agree, conflict with each other is challenging, isn't it? The more we get to know people, the more opportunity there is for us to have differences of opinion, differences in beliefs. People think and act differently than us, and whenever that happens, there's the potential for conflict. And it would be great if every single one of these could be solved with, relax, your blanket will be out of the dryer soon. But that's not the case. Because we live in a world where, with each passing day, there's more and more conflict, and there's more and more things that we can fight about. Right? We have a difference in beliefs. We have a difference in politics. We have a difference in believing how kids should be raised. Even Christians are fighting with each other of what following Jesus should look like or shouldn't look like. It's just like, why are we doing this, right? A recent study showed that the number one behavior that causes conflict is a perceived lack of respect, understanding, or support. It's like, you don't agree with me, you don't understand me, you don't get what I'm going through, so let's fight about it. Well, as we continue our study in the book of James today, we're going to look at a chunk of scripture that focuses on conflict. And the entire book of James is about having a faith that is alive. And if we're going to have a faith that's alive, if we're going to have a faith that's more than just words, we've got to understand what that looks like when it comes to conflict, right? So we're going to be, ta we're going to be parked in 10 verses in James today. It's James chapter 4, verses 1 through 10. So if you've got your Bible, I would encourage you to open it to James chapter 4. And if you don't have a Bible, if you've got a smartphone or a tablet, I would encourage you to log on to the YouVersion Bible app. All the scriptures in there, all my notes are in there, and I'd love for you to follow along. But if I took a poll of every single person in this room and every single person on the live stream and asked, what's the number one source of conflict in your life right now? Chances are we'd have lots of different answers but we'd also have lots of different sources of our conflict. My guess is a lot of us would point to other people, other sources, as the source of our conflict. It's his fault. It's her fault. It's my parents' fault. It's my kids' fault. It's the Democrats. It's the Republicans. It's the Christians, it's the non-Christians, it's COVID, it's the schools, whatever the case may be, right? I mean, we'd have lots of different sources of conflict. And the reason I bring this up is because James uses the first five verses that we're going to talk about today. He uses the first five verses to talk about the source of our conflict, and then the last five verses are the solution. So let's dive in. He starts in James chapter 4, verses 1 through 2. What causes quarrels and what causes fights among you? Is it not this, that your passions are at war within you? You desire and do not have, so you murder. You covet and cannot obtain, so you fight and quarrel. I love that James sounds like a dad right out of the gate, right? You could just picture him like, what is going on here? 
right? Dads, it's like if you see two kids fighting, first words out of your mouth are going to be, who started it? Or, whose fault is it? But James doesn't start with a who question. He starts with a what question. And the reason is because it's not a who problem. It's a what problem. James says the what that causes conflict in our lives are the desires in our own hearts. Now, the word desire here comes from the Greek word hedonin, which is where we get the word hedonism from. And basically what James is saying, it's our own selfish desires, it's our own selfish motives, it's the things within our own hearts that are causing this conflict. He says, we desire, we do not have, and so we fight about it. And right away, I don't know about you, but me, when I think about something desiring but I can't get, my brain first goes to physical things, right? Or like the kid that wants his blanket but can't have it. But as we get older, I think that the things that we want move from the material to the immaterial. It's like we want to be respected. We want to be heard. We want to be understood. We want to be agreed with. And these things aren't necessarily bad in and of themselves. Right? You should want to be respected. But the desires for these things, sometimes the desires, we want these things so badly that it causes conflict. And I think as Christians, as followers of Jesus Christ, it can be especially dangerous for us. Because we can think, okay, listen, I know what the Bible says about something. I know that I'm right, and I know that that person's wrong. So I'm going to dig my heels in, and I'm going to fight in the name of Jesus, and I'm going to feel glorified and justified for it. We say God's word says this is right. God's word says this is wrong. And so I'm going to make it my mission to wage war against the things that are wrong in this world. And in reality, we're just fueling more conflict. If we're not careful, the desire to be right about God can be more important than our desire to be right with God. That's the kind of conflict James is talking about here. He says, you desire and you do not have, so you murder. And right away, about 99% of you are going, oh, thank goodness, he's not talking about me. He's only talking about killers. And I'm making a joke. I don't know if any of you are actually murderers in the room, by the way. <laughs> but let's hang on a second. Because if you've been with us, you know that James was heavily influenced by his brother Jesus and the Sermon on the Mount. And in Matthew chapter 5, Jesus said this, Have you heard that it was said to those of old, You shall not murder, and whoever murders will be liable to judgment? But I say to you that everyone who is angry with his brother will be liable to judgment. See, Jesus says that the murderous heart is one that's filled with anger and pride and so badly wants their way that they kill for it. But James wants us to know that the depth of the anger in our heart, that same anger that drives someone to kill someone, can also drive us to conflict. He's not saying this only applies if you get so angry you actually kill someone, which I know sometimes we feel like that. But when you get so angry, that, that same sort of anger and pride that I have to be right, I have to have it my way, it's the same heart for both of those. Let's continue in verse 2. You do not have because you do not ask. You ask and you do not receive because you ask wrongly to spend it on your passions. So let's be clear. Asking here, when James talks about asking, he's talking about prayer. And God loves it when we pray. I love to pray. I hope you love to pray. And God loves it when we bring our wants and our desires to him. But James says there's two reasons when we do that, we don't get what we ask for. Number one, we don't have because we, ask, we don't ask. And that seems pretty straightforward. But how many times do we try to take things into our own hands instead of praying for wisdom or discernment or guidance from the Lord? It's like, I don't need to pray. I know that I'm right. But many times, God doesn't want us to dig our heels in and know that we're right. He wants us to bring that thing to him and say, Lord, what is your will? Number two, we're praying with the wrong motives. So what are the wrong motives? Well, sometimes we can pray, God, I want this thing so badly. Make it that I'm right. Or God, I feel so strongly about this. Make it so that everybody in the world thinks the same way that I do. 
We're not praying for God's will to be done. We're praying for our will to be done. And prayer isn't to get God to line up with what I want. Prayer is a way for me to line up my will and my desires with what God wants. It's like, God, there's this thing, there's this person, there's this situation, and I'm feeling this way. And I I feel so strongly, Lord, I feel like I'm right, I feel like I want it to go this way, but Lord, what is your will? You are wise and good and just, and I'm not. So Lord, I'm giving this to you, and I'm asking you for wisdom and discernment. God loves prayers like that. But James is calling out when we pray with the wrong motives. Let's go on. He says, you adulterous people, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you suppose that it's no purpose that the scripture says he yearns jealously over the spirit that he has made to dwell within us? That seems pretty harsh, right? I mean, adultery? Really? Really? In the Old Testament, God describes himself several times as a husband to his people. In the New Testament, the church is called the bride of Christ. There are many times in the Bible where the love of a marriage covenant is exemplified by the love of God for his people. If you've ever known the pain of adultery, you know what kind of damage that can have on a relationship. And what James is trying to say is our fights, the quarrels that we get in, they reveal whether we're trying to follow the world or trying to follow Jesus, whether we're trying to be a friend of the world or a follower of Jesus Christ. So what does friendship with the world look like? Like, what does that mean? Because when we hear that, it's important to, to really narrow down what does friendship with the world mean. There's a big difference between what the world wants us to do and what God wants us to do. Can we all agree with this? There's a big difference between what it looks like with following the norm and following Jesus. And if we're trying to follow both, if we're trying to say, God, I want to follow what everyone else is doing, but I also want to follow you, James is saying that's not possible, and it's spiritual adultery. Maybe following the world, maybe being a friend of the world looks different to you. Maybe it's seeking the approval of people over God. Maybe it's justifying certain sin over others. Like, this sin is acceptable, this one isn't. Maybe it's letting people or social media or politics influence what you believe it looks like to be a follower of Jesus Christ. And again, James is echoing the Sermon on the Mount where Jesus says, no one can serve two masters. Either he will hate one and love the other, or he will be devoted to one and despise the other. This can be true of money, It can be true of pleasure. It can also be true of being right. We're always getting our way. Anything that we want so badly that it causes us to fight. And then James says, God jealously longs for the spirit that he has put in us. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ and you've asked Jesus into your heart, made him your Savior and Lord, you are filled with the Holy Spirit and God has a righteous and jealous love that wants all of you, every single part of your heart, every single part of your life. And by the way, this is a good thing. Praise God that he wants all of me. Real love desires each and every part of us. I mean, if I said to my wife, of all the women I love, I love you the most. How would that go? There would be a Pastor John-shaped hole in that wall. I'm just kidding. (laughs) It's like my wife puts up with a lot. If you know me, you know she puts up with a lot. But she doesn't want to be one of the women in my life. She wants to be the only woman in my life. She wants to know that she has each and every part of my heart. And she does, by the way. You're clapping for her. True love in marriage is exclusive. It's faithful. It doesn't let anyone else in. And if that's true of the marriage covenant, how much truer is that of our relationship with our heavenly Father? So how did we get from quarreling and fighting to adultery? Right? It's like, James, you started down this path. 
And now we're over here. Pastor John, I thought this was a sermon about conflict. Why are you getting all up in my business? What James wants us to know is when it comes to conflict, so often our struggle isn't with other people. Deep down, it's with God. And many times, our struggle with other people is an indicator of our struggle with God. And we want to separate them. We want to put the relationship with people in one box and our relationship with God in another box. It's like, God, I don't have a problem with you, but the people over here are nuts. And I know I'm right. I know we're right, God. But the rest of y'all got problems. But how we treat people, how we love people, how we talk to people, how we tag people on social media is a reflection of our relationship with God. And right now you might be thinking, Pastor John, you don't get it. You don't understand what that person said to me. You don't understand what that person did to me. They're wrong. And not only are they wrong, they're sinful. They're going against the word of God. That all may be true. But God's never called us to fix people. He's called us to love people. Last week, Pastor Joe and Amber shared this powerful verse. It said, by this, people will know you are my disciples. If you convince them all that you're right. No. If you win every argument. No. If you passive-aggressively tweet scripture so that people know that you're right and they're wrong. No. By this, people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. So James has taken five verses to highlight the problem. What's the solution? Verse 6 takes the most beautiful turn, but he gives more grace. What a God we serve, right? I mean, people were just accused of spiritual adultery. I would expect to hear, but he gives them a beatdown. He gives them what they deserve. No. He gives more grace. When the conflict is painful, when that thing that person did makes you so angry, he gives more grace. The simplest definition of grace that I've heard is getting a gift that we don't deserve. Oftentimes, mercy and grace are used interchangeably, but they're so beautifully different, I want to tell you what they are. Mercy is when we don't get a punishment that we deserve. And grace is getting a gift that we don't deserve. And Jesus offers us both. Jesus died so that we can, have, we can receive the mercy of not having to pay for our own sins. And we can receive the grace of having a right relationship with our Heavenly Father and being filled with the Holy Spirit. And we can extend that grace to other people. But James says in order to do that, we need to humble ourselves. Verse 6, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Humility looks like when we bring it all to him, God, I feel like I'm right. God, I feel like I'm justified. God, I feel like this is right and this is wrong. Here's what I'm feeling. Here are my hurts. Here's my anger. But I can't do this without you, God. I need your grace. So the humble get grace, and the proud are in opposition to God. I don't know about you, but that sounds like a scary place to be. And when we hear opposition to God, I think sometimes we have in our brains, it's like, okay, God says don't kill people, so the people that kill people are in opposition to God. God says thou shall not steal, so if you rob a bank, you're in opposition to God. But what James is saying hits really closer to home, doesn't it? He's talking about our pride. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. And when we said, God, but you don't, you don't understand... He says, I do understand. Come receive grace. James goes on and says, Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. So there's a three-step process here. Step one, submit to God. Not easy, but quite simple. God, here it is. 
Here's all my desires. Here's everything I'm feeling. Here's everything that's going on in my heart and in my life right now. God, I'm bringing it to you. Here's what I want. Here are my wants and my desires, but it's not about me, God. For your kingdom come and your will be done. So I'm bringing this to you. There's step one, submit it to God. Step two, resist the devil. If you do step one, you'll be able to recognize when something isn't from the Lord. When you sense that something isn't from God, if you submit your life and your desires and your worries and your frustrations to him, you'll be able to understand when something is not from him. And step three, draw near to God. We draw near to God through prayer. We draw, we draw near to God through, through worship. We, we draw near to God through spending time in his word. And what I love about this verse is the word will. It doesn't say resist the devil and he might flee from you. It doesn't say draw near to God and if you're good, he'll draw near to you. No, it says he will. That's a promise from the pages of scripture that we can bring that to the Lord every time. Let's continue. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. So as we draw near to God, we're going to be convicted of things. We're going to be convicted of the things in our lives that we've got to wash our hands of, and that's a good thing. I want to let you know if at any time during a sermon or during a podcast, if God ever convicts you of something and you go, ugh, that's not right, that's a good thing. Because even though, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ and you've been filled with the Holy Spirit, grace is something we need every day. This is not a one-time thing where it's like, I give my life to Jesus and I receive grace and then I'm coasting for life. No, we need that grace. We need that every day. So when it says, uh, cleanse your hands and purify your hearts, there's an outward action and an inward action. Cleansing your hands was something that people did uh, to show that they were taking the steps of getting clean. And for us, it might be take the steps to get right with people. If there are things that we've done that have fueled the conflict, wash your hands. If there are things that you have to do to get right with people, purify your hearts, that's an inside thing. We need to take the steps we need to. Repentance, forgiveness, that tough conversation. It was something God convicted me of over the years, especially as a dad. I used to think conflict with my kids, it was like, I'm the dad. If I say something, it goes. I earned my respect. I earned your, you know, you should listen to the things that I've said. And there are times over the last six years, five, six years, I've had to go to my kids and go, listen, I handled that wrong and I'm sorry. What you did was not okay, but I should not have, result I should not have responded in conflict and I'm sorry. I'm trying to show my kids the grace that God shows me every day. The last sentence might confuse us, so let's talk about it. Be wretched and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. That sounds pretty depressing. I mean, if you're at a barbecue having a great time and someone goes, hey, turn that laughter into mourning and turn that joy into gloom, you're going to be like, the heck is wrong with this guy? Doesn't God want us to be happy? Why would he say these things? God wants us to grieve for our sin the way he does. God wants us to understand the pain that our sin causes him. I think one of the biggest dangers in the Christian life as a follower of Jesus Christ is sometimes we can just brush off our sin like it's no big deal. Like because Jesus took the weight of our, of our sin on his shoulders, we can be like, ah, it's, it's not a problem. No, it is. When we fall short of the glory of God, and we all do, but it hurts God. And he wants us to recognize that. And again, the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. God doesn't want us to grieve our sins so that we can feel horrible about ourselves. He wants us to have a right view of our sins so that we can understand the need for a Savior and the beauty of what Jesus Christ did for us on the cross. And he closes with, humble yourselves before the Lord and he will exalt you. Other translations say he will lift you up. But I love the beautiful bow that James puts on this at the end. Because oftentimes when we feel convicted, when we bring these things, we can feel like we've just been beaten down. And God says, humble yourselves, and I will lift you up. When the world says, pick yourself up, 
when the world says get better, do better, be better, God says no. You come to me with a humble heart and I will lift you up. James chapter 4 is tough to read. I can't do it without doing a heart check. But if all we pull away from this is conviction, then we've missed the point. So we've got to ask a few questions. Number one, are you humble before the Lord? If being right is more important than being humble, you're going to have conflict. Being humble doesn't mean rolling over and let the world walk all over us, but it means bringing everything to the Lord, submitting it to Him and His will. Number two, are you trying to have a friendship with the world and follow Jesus? God says we can't do that. And if we do, we're going to find ourselves in opposition to him. And again, uh, this may look different for different people. Maybe it looks like doing whatever it takes to be accepted by the world. Maybe it means, you know, uh, um, uh, I don't even know. But God says whatever friendship with the world looks like, if it's putting him and his will second, he says bring that to him. And number three, have you received God's grace? Because no matter who you are or what your relationship with Jesus Christ looks like right now, we are all in need of grace. And maybe this is the first time you're hearing of this and you've never taken that step of saying, Jesus, I need you. I understand that I can't do it on my own anymore. I understand that I'm a sinner in need of a Savior. And if that's you, we would love to talk to you afterward. Maybe you are a follower of Jesus Christ. But grace has been at a distance for a while because of your pride. The grace that God offers isn't something we receive once. We need it every single day. And for me, it looks like, God, I can't do this on my own. I'm feeling these things. I'm angry, and I'm, and I'm frustrated, and I know I can't do it, so I'm bringing it to you, and I'm laying it at the foot of the cross, and he says, I've got grace for you. And he says that to you too. When we take hold of the grace that God offers us, we can offer it to other people. At New Life, when we talk about helping people in this community, yeah, we mean tangible things. We mean laundry love, and we mean outreach and compassion, and those things are great. But what people in this world need more is grace. They need to understand that there is a God who loves them so much that he sent his son to die for them. Because there are people in this world, the conflict, when they bring their conflict and all of the junk in their heart, what they're expecting are fights and bitterness and anger and hostility. But what they need is grace. And we can point them to a Savior that says, I've got grace for you, can't we? Let's be the church that's not known for being like the rest of the world. We're not perfect. If you've come to New Life thinking we're perfect church with perfect people, you'll find out soon enough let's show the world what grace looks like and we can share grace because we know what it's like to receive grace amen let's pray father there's a lot of things in this world that cause us conflict there's differences of opinion. There's relationship mess. And God, I'll be the first to admit, sometimes I don't even know what to do or what to say. But thank you that I don't have to solve this stuff on my own. God, for the times that I've tried, for the times that I've said the thing I shouldn't have said or texted the words I shouldn't have done, Lord, I'm washing my hands purifying my heart God we are so humbled by our need for a heavenly father thank you for your grace thank you for your mercy thank you for Jesus and it's in his name we pray amen